uh, uh, Minnetonka Labs uh, just outside of, uh, of, of Minneapolis. And, and thankfully, last night we had a quiet night, um, which we're all very, very thankful for this morning. So what is Minnetonka Labs? We are what's called an idea stage investor. Um, I'm a, a sales and marketing startup guy. Been involved in uh, a lot of different startups over the last 30, 35 years. Uh, my partner, Gino, there uh, is a mechanical engineer by trade, and he owns a premier precision metal uh, fabrication company here in the Twin Cities. Uh, we've known each other for 45 years, uh, but just started this concept in uh, the fall of last year. So we're about nine months into it. So where do we fit in the investment stage of things? Um, we are really kind of at the very, very front end of the process, right? Where uh, an inventor has a patent or an idea, and they're looking to get it from idea into, into reality long before uh, you know, raising serious money. And I'll get into the details of that in a second. <clears throat> so what is our investment model? Uh, we help uh, build prototypes. So we help people get things off of cocktail napkins into reality. Uh, we're an investor and we're a manufacturing incubator. So who do we work with? Uh, we're looking for people and companies, again, at that idea stage. Uh, some have cocktail napkins, some have uh, detailed blueprints and CAD drawings, some have patents already, um, but really at that idea stage, and we really need to help, they want to get it from their idea into a, into a minimally viable product. Um, we're industry agnostic, although generally we're in the hard goods and industrial commercial space. So think industrial products, uh, given my, my apartment background and what he does uh, on a daily basis at his factory. Um, although I spent most of my career in the software industry, um, we are in the, in the physical product space. So think hard tech, uh, logistics, industry applications, and I'll give you an example here at the end of the presentation. Um, and as I said earlier, most of our, our partners have either worked on or applied for a patent. So what do we do? Um, we build blueprints and 3D CAD drawings. Uh, we help with the patent application. Uh, we design uh, engineering docs and specs on various 3D modeling software systems. Uh, we figure out what materials uh, to use in these products. Uh, and then we go through what we call an 11 by four, typically prototyping process, where we'll go through four rounds of prototyping to get the product ready to, do, uh, to go through a manufacturing process. While we're doing that, um, we build, uh, build bid ready specifications. And as importantly as anything, and this is where I come in, is really help figure out the go-to-market strategy, how we're gonna turn this thing into money and not just a physical product. So what is our model? So we don't charge for all this. Um, what we do is we negotiate a success fee on the back end, um, whether it's revenue share or equity or some combination of, 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 the, of both. Um, so we're really trying to address that, 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 that niche early on on that chart showed where an inventor or an idea person has an idea they really don't have the, the, the money and the resource to get it to, to an MVP stage and, uh, and get to that next step. So when we meet with investors and inventors, um, you know, these are some of the problems that we ask people. You know, what is the problem you're really trying to solve here? A lot of guys have great ideas, but they're really not solving a real problem in life, right? Uh, do you have any proof that anybody really cares about this? Uh, is the market ready? Um, how big is the market, right? You know, how much competition is out there? Uh, what stage are your, is your patent in, right? Um, you know, he's usually talk, you know, you're talking anywhere from, you know, five to 20 K to get through that whole process, just legal fees. Uh, is that patent in process or where is it at? Um, what are the prior works of art that you found out there for this particular idea? Uh, how do the macroeconomics work, right? And that's where I come in. I'm the business guy. My partner obviously is the manufacturing guy. And I really drill on to how you can actually turn this thing to into a, a viable revenue model or company, if you will, okay? How are you gonna sell, right? How are you gonna generate revenue? Uh, and lastly, will you be making your livelihood from this? A lot of people have ideas, they have full-time jobs in other companies. Uh, they don't have the ability to, to quit their day job and do this on a full-time basis. Uh, and so that's a really big question that we ask our partners, potential partners, um, is this uh, gonna be your sole source of income or is this a, a side hustle? And that will, that will change our perspective on things. So you have an idea, and I ask this question to people, I say, you know, how do you want to monetize your idea, right? And I've got a much longer presentation I do with investor, inventor groups, uh, but these are a couple of slides that I, uh, I typically share. Um, and I talk about the difference between an inventor and an entrepreneur, right? Because they're very different animals. And what I've found in my, uh, in my experience so far is that people get these two names confused, right? These two words confused, right? 
Uh, an inventor minutes, is simply going to have an idea. Pardon me? You're at five minutes. Five minutes or one minute? One minute to go. Okay, got it. Uh, and an entrepreneur, right, is really somebody who's going to take that idea and turn it into a business. And I, I, I read box down there at the bottom, considerable initiative and risk, right? A lot of inventors think they can become entrepreneurs. And I spent a, quite deal, a great deal of time with people helping them understand the difference. So a couple of ways to monetize your ideas, excuse me, um, is you know, if you're an inventor, you can license your patent or sell your patent. Right, it's pretty simple. Although the, those are not necessarily easy to do for people, and if you're an entrepreneur, right, you can build a product in a company, um, or just a product and private label of somebody else. And so those are kind of the the four options that we give people uh, as they come to us um, as we go through this. Since we launched in um, in uh, October, I've looked at over 50 uh, ideas and inventions. Um, we've chosen four to move forward with. Um, so the response should have been overwhelming. And um, when I go through Q&A, if we have time, I can walk you through a pretty interesting project we're about to launch. But my time is up, so I will pause there for a moment. All right, thank you. Scott, do we have questions? Uh, well, we've got, uh, we've got one. Uh, and Tom, very, uh, very good presentation. Um, lots of information in there and actually very well put together um, without being uh, too wordy on your on, on your slides and stuff so people could listen to you as opposed to having to read too much. So kudos there. Um, first question, do you have a minimum or a maximum limit on your investment or how much you're willing to put into a, a, a project? Uh, we do not. I mean, you know, we're not going to put a billion dollars in, um, but um, it's generally, it, it's, it, we don't have a, you know, this is just my partner and I, right? And we, we've hit a, we've hit a, a market that's very underserved um, and we don't have any preconceived notions as to what a particular deal looks like uh, as we don't have other investors or other board people to answer to. We, we kind of do what we want to do, right? Um, so it's we, we, one deal. I can tell you that um, we're, we're going to launch one uh, a product here that'll it'll take us you know very little time and very little money to do because it's a simple concept. The one on the screen, the blue, um, it's very very complicated. It will be you know well into seven figures to even get through the prototyping phase. Um, do you work with? other regional areas or, or just uh, in, in the, the Minnesota, Minnetonka area that you're in? Well, interesting question. So um, uh, right, so far, all of our work has been done in, in Minnesota. Um, I made my first 1 million cups presentation in November, uh, in early November. Um, and that is that one presentation has spawned these 50 conversations with 50 different inventors. Um, and I pitched probably six other one million cups groups around the uh, around the state. Um, somebody from Orlando reached out to me, um, you know, a couple months back, and uh, I said, "Yeah, I'd love to love to share our story," um, and, and certainly uh, open to uh, to having conversations if it's the right fit outside the Twin Cities. Um, and quite, you know, selfishly, if I could find some business in Florida to go work on in the wintertime. Um, <laughs> That would be awesome uh, because my we're, my wife and I are at that stage of life where, you know, we spent quite a bit of time last last March uh, this you know what, last month uh, down on the uh, on, on on the Gulf Coast side of the of the state. So, um, no, but I'm open to to conversations. We've got a a comment that uh, you should begin going to uh, uh, as many one million cups as as possible across the country because a lot of inventors are in there thinking that they're entrepreneurs. Right. Um, and uh, so this is actually a, probably a good, very, uh, a, a very good venue for you to pitch your, your, your service. Um, now, how long, uh, question, how long have you been involved in this? So we, we, we put our, our LLC together in September and we launched our website in October. And as I said, our first real outreach um, was via one of these meetings in early November. So, uh, you know, less than six months in, in reality. And the response we've gotten 
really speaks to the, 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 the need of that very idea stage help um, that a lot of inventors really, uh, really need and they can't find. So we, we've, we've, we've come across something that's bigger than we thought it was in terms of the need. Um, our big question is going to be at Minnetonka Labs is, you know, how, do, how big do we want to make this thing? Because it's a model that seems to have, um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of validation at least after six months. All right now, as you're um, kind of creating entrepreneurs out of these inventors, uh, what what startup model do you do you have? Are you using uh, lean practices or startup model canvases? Uh, I, lean is probably the best way to describe it. Um, you know, we we haven't. You know, we've, we're starting for. Um, well, let me back up. So when I started this, the, the original thesis was is that we would we'd work with an inventor, we'd help him engineer his or her product, get him through this prototyping phase. I would help figure out their business plan, their go to market strategy, all that great stuff. Um, kind of pat them on their head and, and send them on their way to go start a company. Um, and we would, in exchange for that, we would, you know, take a small, you know, 5% equity share or something like that for sort of helping them kind of get traction and, and get moving. Um, what we discovered was that very few that we've met so far actually have the ability to, um, to do that on their own and have all come to us and said, I want to do this, but I want to do it with you guys. Can we start a company together? Uh, you know, Tom, you, you be the the CEO and the sales and marketing guy and Gino, you take over manufacturing and I'll kind of, I'll kind of be the idea guy. Right. And so now we're, we're looking at starting, you know, three or four new companies, um, which quite frankly, maxes me out. Right. Um, to say the least. And so part of that formation process, right. Is forming that corporation um, and then going through a lean um, prototyping process um, We've got a, a shell within my, my, my partner's you know, factory that we do this in. And it, um, it works out really well because we can use a lot of his own resources in terms of staffing and equipment to do that stuff. And we can move really, really quickly. So I'd say at a high level, lean is, is, is right up, is the best way to describe what we're doing here. All right, uh, question, um, are, are there any particular verticals that you concentrate on? Healthcare, financial education, B2B, B2C? Yeah, like I said, it's, it's really, uh, I'd consider it B2B industrial, okay? Um, a lot of experience doing telecommunications hardware, uh, logistics things. Um, this uh, blue owl that I'm looking at right now, I'll just show you a picture of, uh, it is a, it's an IoT, faucet for teaching people how to visibly wash your hands. Um, so we'll be building first ever uh, IOT faucet um, that will be used in commercial applications such as hospitals and clinics and restrooms and uh, schools to help teach people how to properly wash their hands. Um, it's a very complicated product. Uh, it's probably 150 parts of this thing. Uh, and it will be sold into a, a new industrial application. So um, think, think B2B, think uh, you know, heavy durable goods is the best way to describe it. Have you uh, had the opportunity or are you prepared for the opportunity to tell somebody that their baby is ugly? Yes, I've done that on many occasions. Um, I had a couple of um, students from the University of Minnesota call me up about two months ago and they told me that a patent for a... Um, uh, an electronic disc about this big with six pie shapes in um, that you put in the base of a urinal and when it gets hit with water it lights up and changes lights and plays music in the bottom of a men's urinal at a bathroom at a restaurant and I told these two guys that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my life uh, but good luck to you <laughs> so <laughs> yes uh, I, I, I will say no quickly uh, for everybody's uh, everybody's benefit, it'd be a good potty training tool for boys. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I told them. But they got the, they want to put it in nightclubs, and you know they're twenty five years old, and um, they want to put it in nightclubs and enhance the guest experience because those forty seconds are the only forty seconds 
you don't have a device in front of you. And I told him, I said, well, thank goodness I get 40 seconds of peace and quiet once a day. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, Rupert mentions there are actually similar products to that out there in the marketplace. Right, right. So a lot of stuff, this isn't up for alley. Um, so in a lot of stuff, people say, hey, this is really cool. And, and I look at it and I say, I don't know how you make money off of it. And, and you know, my partner talked about how do you build it, but ultimately, um, I look at everything through the lens of how do you make a business out of this? Well, and that goes back to your first question there of, of what problem are they solving? Exactly. There's a lot of cool stuff out there, but I just, it's hard for me to imagine people actually writing checks for them. All right. Well, Eric will uh, post you our final question. All right, Tom, thank you very much. And I uh, uh, appreciate hearing about this. Uh, the final question that we ask everybody is, uh, what can we as a community do for you? So yeah, great question. Um, simply put, um, if you have, if you know of inventors um, or people with ideas sort of in the, in the verticals that we talked about, um, have them go to our website, have them go to minnetonkalabs.com. My phone number's on there, my email's on there. Um, it's, it's pretty, or you can pull it right off of here. Um, and so really just for us, it's getting the word out uh, to people that have ideas, that they're, that they're at this idea stage of their journey. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to people and give them advice. Uh, I don't charge for those kind of conversations. And so I really enjoy, quite frankly, getting to know, you know, inventors, people's ideas and, and, and want to explore how to, how to, you know, turn them into things. Uh, so I'm happy to take, uh, I get probably two or three phone calls a week and and I just enjoy that process, whether we do something with them or not. So I'd welcome that, um, you know, that networking opportunity. Be sure to put your contact information in the chat. Yep, will do. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh... you're welcome. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm Christina Drake, and I'm the founder of Kismet Technologies. And Kismic Technologies is working to forever change the human experience of surface disinfection. And so today I'm really excited to talk to everyone about Nanorad, uh, the world's first true residual surface disinfectant. And I'm gonna apologize in advance because I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> so anyways, many of us are familiar with getting sick, um, whether that's cold, flu, or now COVID-19. Um, and many of these illnesses are caused by contagious pathogens um, and you get it by, or you catch it by coming into contact with someone that's sick with the illness or touching a contaminated surface that has that pathogen on it. Um, and pathogens are just simply viruses and bacteria um, that cause illnesses. Communicable respiratory infections remain amongst the top causes of death worldwide, um, even though they're preventable. Um, and despite the increased use of surface disinfectants, hospital-acquired infections still affect 1 in 24 patients in the United States, with about 100,000 deaths in the U.S. per year. And worldwide, this number is much higher. Uh, the tragedy in these illnesses and deaths is that many of them are actually preventable. So Nanorad can help prevent the spread of contagious illness. NanoRad stands for nanobased residual active disinfectant, and it has four key features. The first is that it keeps surfaces disinfected for a long time without reapplication re after it has been applied to the surface. Second, it has rapid disinfecting power when it is applied, which means the surface doesn't need to be pre-disinfected for application. Third, it decreases human exposure to chemicals because less disinfectant is used overall to achieve surface disinfection. And fourth, it decreases impact to the planet because fewer disinfectant bottles and wipes are now needed to keep surfaces um, pathogen free. Getting rid of viruses and bacteria on a dry surface is a very, very difficult problem. And to give you an appreciation for how difficult this is, um, viruses are much smaller than bacteria. And you can imagine this by thinking of a flying insect on the back of an elephant, and that gives you an idea for the size difference between viruses and bacteria. Now you can think of a dry residual, dry residual sanitizer, such as Microban 24, um, as a fence that basically stops an elephant from becoming infective if it were a bacteria, um, but not actually being able to stop the flying insect. 
So dry residual disinfectants actually have to be able to contact both bacteria and viruses. And so now you can imagine it at the size scale of an elephant as an enclosure that is able to both stop the elephant and the insect from escaping and becoming infective. And in this case, the better the residual disinfectant, the smaller those gaps are in terms of preventing that insect from fleeing the enclosure. And so Nanorad is able to both effectively contact and safely kill bacteria and viruses. Nanorad um, outperforms residual disinfectants, and um, I'm going to walk through what those are. Um, and on this chart, I've included microband 24 because it is often confused as a residual disinfectant, even though it is not. It is only a residual sanitizer. Now, the US EPA has approved two residual disinfectant products. Um, and so that's surface wise two and copper development association has copper alloys on the registry list. Um, and copper alloys are literally you have a doorknob or a sink made of copper so its application is limited. Now both of these registered products take two hours to reach efficacy and per the EPA you still have to apply a topical disinfectant. So in order for these to actually act as a residual disinfectant. You can think of them really as safety nets to continued topical disinfection. Nanorad is different. Nanorad disinfects when it's applied to a surface. When it's dried, it kills in 15 to 30 minutes. It can be spray applied to multiple types of surface and would only require mild topical cleaning instead of disinfection. And so when Nanorad hits the market, it will be the world's first true residual self-disinfecting uh, technology. The market opportunity for Nanorad, uh, the total antiseptic and disinfectant market was 20 billion in 2019, and the surface disinfectant market was four and a half billion in 2020. So those were pre-pandemic numbers. Um, and a five to 10% market capture of the surface disinfectant market would garner 225 to 450 million in revenue. Now in our customer interviews, um, we found that small healthcare businesses were strongly impacted by the need to disinfect rooms between patients or clients. Um, and for them, they actually had this problem before the pandemic. Um, and because of this um, room turnaround time due to disinfection, um, their potential client throughput was down about 20% per day, um, which translated to about $1,000 a day in lost revenue for a four room practice. And so they were interested in even paying a premium for a safe residual disinfectant because of that lost revenue. So a 15% capture of the US market for small healthcare practices um, in the US would get us to our bottom um, number in terms of potential market capture. Now, we're also looking at hospitals um, for our end users for this product, and they have um, about a $40 billion a year price tag dealing with hospital acquired infections. So big need there as well. One minute. So getting Nanorad to um, the market, um, we our superpower is in our active ingredient, which we would scale up manufacture through a contract manufacturer um, that we would sell as a chemical constituent to companies that license from us the formulation. Uh, we would give them a pathway to sub-register their products with the US EPA under our registration for Nanorad, and they would sell to um, their existing company customers in disinfection. Our company has sp spoken with Reckitt Benkiser, the parent company for Lysol, and also with BioPlanet about potential licensing. BioPlanet is also a strategic partner of Clorox and has offered to um, facilitate those discussions. Our team is small, um, but we're hoping to grow rapidly in the next year. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Kismet and one of the co-inventors of Nanorad, um, and I have a lot of experience in scaling up material technologies and health tech. Dr. Sudipta Seal is also one of the co-inventors of Nanorad um, and is one of the world's foremost experts in Nanoseria, which is the material system Nanorad is based in. Dr. Griffith Parks is also on our team. He's our virologist to make sure that our efficacy claims are accurate, and he's an internationally recognized expert in um, RNA viruses. This year, we're hoping to add a full-time business person and also someone whose expertise is in synthesis scale-up of nanomaterials. Uh, this is my contact information and two other ways if you want to find out about what we're doing at Kismet. And so now I'll open the floor to questions. Well, great, Christina. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, this looks like a fantastic product. Um, 
and uh, uh, very much needed as we go forward in you know, things that are going on in the world. Um, we do have some questions, a couple uh, related to business and, and some related to the product itself. Uh, I'm going to start, uh, you, you talked about licensing. Um, are you also looking at, uh, at white labeling the, the, the product? Yeah, so I've actually spoken with a company in Canada that does that. Um, so yes, we've, we're exploring that as well. And the, uh, the patent status? So we have patent pending on synthesis, formulation, and end use. Okay. And that is a co-invention with UCF, but um, Kismet Technologies um, has an exclusive option that we are converting to an exclusive license. Great. Um, how do you have, well, one question from Eric, how can you overcome the education process uh, to be able to persuade buyers that this is a better product? Yeah, so that is actually um, a huge challenge that we've had. So what we are currently doing is um, actively looking for hospitals uh, to do studies with, because one of the things that we've found is, you know, people don't understand the science behind it because it is not that straightforward, but they tend to um, understand like if a hospital is using something and it decreases hospital acquired infections, um, that tends to gain traction with people who don't have um, science literacy in disinfection. Okay, and kind of a series of questions here um, from Mark. Uh, do you have data showing its efficacy over time and how does it bond to a surface to remain effective uh, for, for a couple of weeks there? And I've got a couple others, but we'll let you go with those. Yeah, so we have shown efficacy with time, um, wet and dry. Uh, and I, I don't know if you noticed on the product comparison, I have one to 14 days because we're currently doing a series of tests to see how long uh, we can get it to last. So we feel confident up to a day. We're trying to see how long uh, we can push that out. And we actually have a special formulation that has um, biosafe polymers in it um, that are transparent. Um, and that have good mechanical adhesion um, in a thin film form uh, to multiple types of surface. So um, stainless steel, uh, polymers or plastics, and then also on glass. And um, because our nanomaterials that we're using, they're very, very tiny, three to five nanometers. Um, so invisible, very small. Uh, we only need a very uh, thin film actually to get really, really good efficacy um, on surfaces. All right, and there's uh, assurance that it's not getting cleaned away then after that? Yeah, so one of the, th so we're doing wear tests. So in our wear test, we look at both dry adhesion and wet adhesion. So we're, or not wet adhesion, wet abrasion, sorry. Um, it's adhe it's adhe heat adhesioned to a surface, but we do wet and dry abrasion to that film on a surface. Okay, any environmental contamination issues or concerns? So we're constant. We're currently working with a toxicity um, firm, and we're running toxicity tests. Um, we are using this at very low concentration, so the final formulation looks like it'll be around 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 weight percent. Um, and so the concentrations that we're using it at, um, and the overall length of efficacy on a surface, we're thinking that um, there's not going to be much of it released into the environment. And for like a data point of comparison, um, Syria is currently used in um, a lot of fuel. So it's in exhaust already <laughs> being put out into the environment. And it's actually used um, as a, uh, like in sealants, um, as a UV protectant in like wood. Um, so you're already exposed um, basically to larger amounts of Syria than what we would be using um, in our specific uh, variant of nanoceria. All right. Um, it, in that uh, kind of in that realm, is there a specific application method to ensure that you're fully covering a surface? And then uh, a, 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 another question about the product itself: uh, Does it kill a specific category of viruses, or is it pretty all-encompassing? So we are looking at for our. For longer applications, so trying to get out to a week to two weeks of efficacy, we do think it needs to be electrosprayed so that it has really great mechanical characteristics. Um, we're thinking that if you were to use a pump spray, you're probably only gonna get to like one to two days just because you get an uneven film um, from that type of application. 
In terms of viruses, we've been able to show um, with our uh, researchers at the School of Medicine here at University of Central Florida, we actually get the entire broader, broad array of viruses. So enveloped, non-enveloped, negative, positive. Um, we've actually been able to show great efficacy across the different classes of viruses, which was our hard problem to solve. Um, and then we have another researcher that's working on bacteria. So we know for staph and pseudomonas, which are the two that you have to get in order to get EPA registration um, as a disinfectant, we already have wet and dry efficacy against both of those. Do you have uh, um, a, a financial backing for this or are you bootstrapping at this point? And what are you looking at for your pricing model? Both retail so, yeah, so in terms of um, how we're financing this, uh, we received a federal grant um, from the National Science Foundation for 250K. We've also received um, angel investment, also 250K. So we've received 500K so far. Um, and that's what we're doing, you know, for our proof of concept and initial prototypes um, and some of these third party tests that have to get done um, for product safety. Um, and then the next question was on pricing model? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so on that, we're actually working with a contract manufacturer to see if we scale it up to a certain point what the cost per kilogram would be. And so with our known concentrations um, that we're working with, um, we're able to price out based on, you know, how many bottles were sold, um, you know, gallons, um, and what we think the price point of those could be. Uh, we're able to work out what we think um, sales could be based on potential customers uh, for certain companies that we're working with. Okay, got a couple of recommendations. Uh, one, uh, asking if you've uh, gotten in touch with anyone or are working with the National Association of Women Business Owners. No. Uh, NAWBO, <laughs> a recommendation to, to reach out to them. And um, there is a, a, a Dr. Kimmy Sangaya, am I saying that right, Denny? At UCF Medical uh, School that uh, claims he can kill viruses and has a number of patents. So there may be someone else uh, at UCF that, uh, that you can. Yeah, Kimmy Sangaya is pretty brilliant. You should get in touch with him. It's amazing what he can do. He knows more about the human brain than I think any person alive. But he claims he can kill virus, and the guy has 71 patents, so he knows what he's talking about. He could be a real key for you guys. All right, and I'm going to uh, volley over to Eric for the final question. All right, Christina, very well done. And uh, it's cool to see something so, so important coming out of Orlando. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question you heard me ask Tom earlier, what can we as a community do for you? Yeah, so um, I am a researcher that is very quickly trying to be a full-time business person. Um, I'm looking basically for a co-founder or partner. Um, and so I'm looking for people to basically um, date, interview, <laughs> to be a co-founder with me to help me. Because I really see this as, um, you know, it has great economic impact in the United States. Uh, but worldwide in terms of the potential for hospitals and countries that, you know, where sanitation is a big issue, this could have a huge impact. And so we want to see this go big and to really make a dent in terms of illnesses. Um, and so I feel like I need a business partner. Um, and so I'm always looking for recommendations um, for people to talk to since everyone I know is an engineer or scientist. And not that, not knocking engineers or scientists, but um, I think I need to get outside. I need to get outside of my my group. Yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah, we know all about engineers and scientists, like Mark Mark Himmel. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'll get in touch with you later.